Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. Hello, and welcome back to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm Ellen, I'm your host, and I am enjoying the wonderful sense of possibility and renewal that comes with springtime. When the sun comes out a little more than it has in previous months, the tender green buds are emerging on this somewhat bare trees. And here in Ballarat, we see the cute, fluffy grey cygnets, the baby black swans waddling with their parents around our lake, Lake Wendery. It's a glorious time of anticipation as we look forward to summer, but haven't yet started to complain about the heat. Now, did you know that tomorrow, September the 12th, is Are You OK Day here in Australia? Of course, tomorrow may not be September the 12th, depending on when you're listening to this episode. But right now, as we hit the air, tomorrow is September the 12th and Are You OK Day. And for those who perhaps don't know about Are You OK Day, and if you're listening somewhere in the big wide world outside of Australia, you might not. The mission of Are You OK Day is to inspire and empower everyone to meaningfully connect with the people around us and particularly to start a conversation with anyone who might be struggling with life and its challenges. And I'm really pleased to be able to bring you today's episode just prior to Are You OK Day, because I feel that in all of our conversations about wellbeing and mental health, particularly across our community, there's a section of our population that we neglect who don't get the discussion that they deserve and from today's interview clearly need and that's our older adult population. So let's open up that conversation a little today with my wonderful guest. I have with me today Dr Julie Badgick-Smith and we're talking about the well-being of older adults, particularly those in aged care or entering aged care homes. And Julie is a psychologist and an aged care psychology consultant She's one of the very few psychologists who specialise in this field, and she's on a mission to change the landscape of psychological support and wellbeing in aged care. And she's got a three-pronged attack or approach. She works with allied health workers to get them more involved in aged care. She supports employees within aged care to better understand and manage the psychological needs of their clients. And she aids families to go from being overwhelmed and confused about the aged care transition to becoming a vital support network for their loved ones. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to talk to you because it's not a topic that people talk about very much. I'll ask you shortly about why it's also not an area that psychologists have traditionally gone into, but it's not a topic that we talk about very much. So I'm keen to learn particularly from you Firstly, just a little bit about yourself and how you came to specialise in aged care. You're exactly right. Aged care is not something that people often talk about. And not only that, not many allied health professionals specialise in working in this population, particularly those in mental health. I stumbled across aged care about 10 years ago, a bit more than that. I was asked to do some assessments one day in an aged care facility for a sister company where I worked in occupational rehabilitation. And I just remember thinking how rewarding it was to work with people who genuinely need our help and genuinely need non-pharmacological strategies to improve the quality of their life at that late stage where, you know, perhaps their physical health has been compromised. So my workload has changed a lot over the course of the last 10 years. Initially, I started off by providing services to the elderly, less ambulant people who live in their own homes and those who entered into aged care. And in the past three years, since completing my PhD, I've been working uh, closely with aged care staff and training other psychologists to tap into aged care. Okay, so you started 
doing the work yourself and you're now doing the kind of foray into helping develop the profession or develop the field more generally through others. Would that be right? Absolutely. I realise that, you know, I'm, I'm one person and there's only so many appointments we can do in a day and that it's not so much about the work that I do one-on-one with clients in seeing them. It's more so about the workforce. So I'm talking about people who work in the community settings and aged care settings who deal with clients who are isolated, depressed, lonely, you know, secondary to their physical health issues and who really struggle to motivate them to have those very important conversations, upskilling other psychologists to help as well, upskilling the skills of the the families who really might be finding it difficult to cope with what they love health and more broadly the aged care workforce. Okay, so that's that three-pronged attack really looking at helping yes. the workforces, uh, the families and then allied health as a profession. So, Julie, can you tell me a bit more about what are some of the issues that are facing the aged care population? Why is there this need to develop this field? Well, as we get older, our level of engagement with community, our independence, our support network changes. Only a very small percentage of older Australians move into residential care. We're talking about, you know, less than 5%. But it is an issue when you go through grief and loss, which we all do at some stage in our lives, and, and more so about the a cumulative effect of what can happen as we're getting older, you know, when people retire, how they spend their time and how they engage in meaningful activities, how they participate in physical activity, social interactions, and, you know, particularly if they are less ambulant and able to get out out and about, how does that affect them and their well-being? It is well known that women and men age quite differently, that women are have tend to have stronger social connections and that for men, when they retire, they find it a bit more difficult to fulfil their days. I'm speaking generally here. Obviously, there are a lot of individual differences, but with any changes that could happen to another person's health, support network, their financial situation... All these factors can contribute towards changes in their emotional well-being and their level of support. So it's really quite a holistic approach that you're dealing with here. You're not just looking, obviously, there are mental health issues that arise and I think most people are reasonably aware of the physical health issues that might occur for this population, this group of people. But, yeah, things like I was just, as you were speaking, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, financial stuff, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that could change how just how you live, all of those things we know about, you know, what contributes to well-being generally about that connectedness with other people, about being able to engage in our community, about having a sense of meaning and purpose and, and doing those sorts of things. If they feel constrained or we're less able to do them as we get older, that can't help but have an impact, can it? Absolutely. And when you think about, you know, an older person you know, if they have changes in their five senses, you know, if they can't hear as well, if they can't see as well, how does that affect the interactions, the engagement? If they have, you know, worries about their finances, how do they hear that reassurance from family that, you know, things are going to be okay? There's a lot of worries about moving into residential care because of the financial implications. And often, families don't necessarily have those discussions because things could change overnight. An older person might have a fall, they might have a stroke, they might have something that happens quite suddenly and whereby they're hospitalised and moved into aged care rather quickly. And so you're dealing with the, the shock and adjustment of what has happened to them, the change environment and the change in their independence, their mobility, and suddenly, you know, they find themselves in a very unfamiliar environment, which is perhaps not as easy to accept given everything else that might be going on with them and the changes that they need to adapt to with their with their physical health. As I mentioned, it is not a large portion of population that moves into aged care, but as we 
we have aging population, more and more older people, the numbers are quite staggering. You know, we've got nearly 300,000 people in aged care facilities in Australia. So it's, it's a very large population on one end. And on the other, you do have a lot of elderly people living in their own homes who might still have health conditions, but they haven't, or maybe they're waiting to move into an aged care facility because of their support needs, or they've got families, or they've got finances behind them to support them remain in their own homes. So the mental health of older adults really varies according to a number of factors, you know, their, their health status, the environment, and all those other factors, you know, as well as finance that they can impact it. We know that in the community, people are mentally a lot healthier as opposed to residential care. In residential care, the latest research shows that one in two residents have symptoms of depression. Mm. So that is very alarming in many ways and we need to do something about it. Yeah, because as you were saying just earlier about that fact, and, and again, something I probably hadn't really thought about, but how quickly something could change. And I can only imagine if you're a family member of somebody who has perhaps had a stroke or a fall that's led them to be you know, significantly impaired in some way and there has been a requirement to move into an aged care home or facility, that just, just by nature of how we operate as a, as a society, our focus would be very much on physical health. Mm. So what medication they might need, what tests they might need, what medical support they might need. And I can well imagine that particularly with that focus and the fact that we don't talk about it as a community, that very little time or attention might be given to what kind of emotional support do people need, what sort of how are we going to keep people engaged with their community or their friendship group or, or any of those sorts of things. Absolutely. Um, mental health conditions in older people are not detected as easily. Doctors are very busy and have limited time with patients. You know, we're talking about 10-minute consults where they need to review medication, any physical symptoms that they have. And so mental health is not something that is discussed as openly. Older people also might not realise that the symptoms that they have, the physical symptoms that they have, could be related to their depression or anxiety or adjustment difficulties. Mm. So there's a lot to unpack in, in, in that area in terms of educating families and the workforce and all the people themselves, you know, about what types of symptoms they might experience when they have depression or anxiety. Anxiety, in my experience, has often been attributed to personality traits. And depression in older people is masked by far more physical symptoms than in younger populations. So a younger person is not going to talk to you about their pain or about their memory problems as much an older person is. But if depression is treated in an older person, their memory can, in fact, improve. So we're not just assuming mm. that depression and dementia are a normal part of ageing. Yeah, yeah, because there are, I mean, we, we do know that depression has an impact on cognitive function and certainly that kind of awareness of pain, those pain management techniques that I know some of our colleagues use, which is very much around, you know, how do we find ways to not so much focus on the pain, if you know what I mean. And I can imagine, again, that would be particularly if the mindset of, of somebody in that age group and those people around them, both the medical professionals and also their family, is that, well, you're old, of course you're going to feel pain. And sort of the talking about it, you know, just re-emphasises it. And yet, as you say, it, it might not be a physical aspect. It, it might be. And, and those that body-mind connection is complicated, isn't it? But, yes, yeah, so interesting. It really is, and, and it is something that is quite difficult to unpack. And, you know, when I train other mental health professionals how to get into aged care, and we do also cover that aspect about how you engage with the older person and how you approach them. Because I've certainly had an experience of, you know, having a referral to see someone and, you know, the older person 
you know, in the in the initial couple of meetings, being so petrified that maybe the result of my assessment would mean that they need to get more psychiatric help, that they need to move into institution, they are in a facility, that they're going to be moved elsewhere. So there's a lot of fear associated with mental health in all of the people. I understand, you know, for a lot of people growing up, mental health was not something that you talk about and it was something certainly seen as a sign of weakness and you just you know tended to get on with it and I can particularly see that in my clients who who have had history of trauma of war they've never had any treatment or support for what they've gone through but in their in their late life they're finding it very difficult to adjust to being in residential care because they don't have the skills in how to adapt to that new environment with changes in their physical health as well. So perhaps early in the life they had different strategies how they coped with their anxiety or with their depression. But now that they are not driving, not able to engage in those pleasant activities that they need to initiate themselves, we we need that this is why I'm really focused on upskilling the workforce in in how to tackle those issues and how to support older people because Ellen, we're not having enough discussions about mental health with older people. We're not having enough discussions on how to help people. And the old model of aged care was very much focused on, okay, quickly send a referral to the GP and then, you know, oh, but who's going to go and see them? We must have more conversation. The highest rates of suicide in Australia are in men aged 85 plus. And so this is an alarming statistic and especially now with the are you okay day 12th of september this year it really is important to have those conversations and not to be afraid to ask them because i think there's a lot of fear within the workforce and the wider community to ask people how they're feeling in fear of you know well if i ask that question how what if they respond like what do i do about it but it really doesn't actually cost us anything to ask someone how they're feeling and it can certainly change the demographics of our statistics. Yeah, absolutely. And Julie, when you are working with other allied health professionals or or anybody, I suppose, particularly around, I'm interested because of that notion that struck me too, that older adults, the generations they've come from, the background, you know, we still do have a fair bit of stigma around mental health. And I can imagine that would be a particularly fearful topic perhaps than perhaps it is now for our younger generation. So how do you work with the trainees that you're working with? So other psychologists or allied health professionals and perhaps families to overcome a bit of that resistance to perhaps spark those conversations that they might need to have, whether on Are You OK Day or any other day? I Look at non-pharmacological strategies that we can use to boost well-being, and it's well documented that reminiscence and life review is very effective with older people. So rather than focusing on skills that they may not have at the moment because they find it difficult accepting, you know, the fact that they can't make their favourite Christmas pudding anymore or that they can't go bushwalking, we talk about different stages in their life, pleasant moments, favourite Christians, or building up those rich stories which really builds up on their confidence, self-esteem, sense of value. And even if they've had some difficulties, you know, I had a client tell me about how his car broke down in central Australia and how he had to spend a couple of nights in the desert. It was more so talking about how he overcame those challenges. And so By using reminiscence and life review, other allied health professionals or trainees and families are able to build on those skills and strengths because we're working with resilience and we are working with the abilities of older people rather than focusing on their disabilities. I hope that makes sense. It does. Look, it makes perfect sense, particularly to me, because I work in the field of positive psychology. So it really is looking at what are the past successes? What are the things that we know that are working well? And really looking at, you know, a solution focus approach, I suppose, you know, building on what we know works rather than trying to fix what isn't working or talking about, yeah, as you say, what, you know, their disablement or, or what they've lost. So kind of trying to spark those positive 
thoughts, those positive feelings that we know contribute to that greater sense of well-being and resilience. And, and in, in a broader sense, what this also means for aged care providers, given that they've had new quality standards introduced as a first of July, it really is about delivering that person-centred approach and ensuring that the activities offered in aged care homes are in line with the older person's interests, abilities and skills. So gone are the days where they would just have random activities, you know, bingo and musicals that people might not necessarily be interested in. We know that music is very effective for depression and anxiety, but it, it's also about tailoring it to make sure that it's in line with that person's interests. So I know for so long now, <laughs> visiting an aged care home and, you know, you see they put on musical on Reu DVD on repeat and again and again, and no one listens to that. Mm. So it's about how we can work more effectively with music. How can we bring on site a music therapist who can engage with a small group of residents, get them involved with creating music, bringing those pleasant memories back and incorporating that into their daily activities. Yeah, wonderful. Did you happen to catch Dr. Sarah Mackay, who's a, been a past guest on the podcast, and she hosted an episode of the Catalyst program on the ABC recently about brain health. And one of the little experiments that she was part of as part of that program was exactly what you've just described. They had a music therapist come on and they set up a choir within this aged care facility. And we got to meet some of the participants and hear a little bit about their stories. And she was then tracking things like stress levels and quality of sleep. And it was a really lovely example. She and the other therapist, whose name I've forgotten, at the end of it were in tears <laughs> as they watched this choir perform. You could see these people light up and they had, you know, their family and friends there as part of the audience. It, it was a, a wonderful real-life example of exactly what you've just described. Yeah, I, I've just come back from overseas, so I think I've missed that episode. But there's just more and more awareness about different ways that we can enhance on the skills and abilities of older people. So music is so beneficial, as is art therapy. I've, you know, had the privilege of working with some amazing art therapists who have really helped a number of older adults in terms of their emotional well-being by allowing them to express themselves in art. Again, a few years ago, all you would see in aged care facilities would be colouring books and less of that person-centred approach to art mm. therapy. But if you have the right people who know how to engage that activity, you can see some amazing outcomes. And so in a couple of facilities I've been to, I've seen amazing artworks that they've created. People did not necessarily have a background in painting and they use different mediums and they work with people with different abilities. So as opposed to thinking you know, of someone, oh, you know, they have dementia, they have this, they have that, you can actually see what they can still create. And I, I spoke with an art therapist a couple of weeks ago and she said she had this gentleman who had advanced dementia and he had lots of behaviours and she got him to come along to art, an art class and he drew this amazing bird and everyone was just so blown away with what he was actually able to do as opposed to being, you know, described as someone with challenging behaviours and difficulties. So mm. there's still a lot that older people can contribute to society and there's still a lot that they can do. It's just about how we extract that information from them and remind them that they're still very important. Yeah, so really that absolutely that personalising and, and working with the individual to uncover what is going to excite or stretch or inspire or contribute to their well-being and then yet yeah, taking that much more positive approach to saying let's not focus on what you can't do let's focus on what you can do yes yes and this is something Ellen that will still take time to be embedded into day-to-day -day services I mean I want that change of focus from staff you know who come in and say oh you know Mr Brown we're here to shower you and Mr Brown getting all stressed about oh you know having complete strangers or members of a much younger than him helping with activities, but making it into a pleasant experience for the older person and using that time to talk about something 
other than just the task at hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that might be an opportunity as much as a distraction as anything else to, to reminisce about something that they've achieved in the past or to talk about the fact that they've got maybe grandchildren coming to visit or something other like that. Yeah, or, or something that's on site that day that will encourage them to leave their room and reduce that isolation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because in reality, some of those clients, the only contact they might have with someone is by having, you know, someone who comes and assists them with their personal care as opposed to getting involved and engaged in activities. Mm. So you talk then about part of your goal, which is to try and improve this in personalisation to give people who work in the field the skills and the confidence to do things perhaps a little differently than how it's been done in the past. And within that, that's a, that's a bigger goal that you've got there to boost the well-being of older adults in Australia and indeed is it to halve the depression yes. depression rate so yeah you've stated that as a goal mm. that you've got can you tell us a little bit more about that well depression is very very prevalent in aged care facilities and if we're not addressing it adequately I can't see how things will change anytime soon the impact of poor mental health in clients has much broader issues in terms of the workforce, their job satisfaction. We have staggering rates of staff turnover in aged care. And for families, it's also quite difficult because they're seeing the changes in their loved one's physical health, but also emotional as well. And that can affect them and their own well-being. So if we look at the ways of how we can create mentally healthy aged care facilities, we're likely to see a broader impact of that in the entire environment. So we want to see improved mental health outcomes for an older person in their late life, families being more involved and being able to support their loved one, as well as the workers feeling confident and feeling able in their skills and their knowledge base around mental health. So you provide training to employees within aged care facilities and for those organisations that run these facilities. Yep. And you also provide, and I know you have on your website, some support and resources available for families perhaps to have these conversations. Yes, I have a, um, an online resource for families specifically in how to emotionally support their loved one's adjustment into an aged care facility, a number of strategies, evidence-based strategies that they can use um, when they go and do visits. I know that for families it is quite difficult when their loved one moves into a facility and how they should go about supporting them and what's the right way to do, how often should I visit, how often should I be away. And so my approach to that really is about encouraging families to help their loved one adjust to being in a home, which includes you know, looking at what is on offer on site and helping older adults attend those activities, integrating them into that new environment rather than spending time in the older person's bedroom and coming and going and not mixing as much with other residents or activities or with staff. Or Also what I see is older person getting picked up to go on an outing um, with a family, which is lovely and it's very important that that's done. But if families are not engaging with the environment, the older person is also less likely to do that themselves. Yeah, I think that's a great tip. I'm thinking back to visiting my grandfather when he was in his, he lived till he was 93, so he did very well. Right. Um, And in those, but we did go to visit him. But you're right, we didn't tend to, we tended to go and visit him in his room. Mm. And we'd all kind of pile in there, but there wasn't so much. And I know I wasn't nearly as actively involved. My mum and her sisters were far more actively involved. So um, I'm not entirely sure what they did, but the idea of just getting people out and perhaps walking around the garden together or going and checking out what the activities that are on or yeah. engaging with other staff while you're there, you know, and you can you know, perhaps facilitate more of a conversation or lo- lots of other different things that you could do beyond just sitting in their room and talking. Absolutely, because if the older person is just sitting in their room, what will tend to happen is that they will 
sit in that room waiting for family rather than attend activities. I've seen that time and time again. The older person is sitting waiting for their daughter and then it's like, oh, no, it's Tuesday. She'll be there mm. on Thursday. And so they're missing mm. out on activities on site because they, they don't want to miss out on seeing their loved one. And they're worried that if their daughter or son or grandchild comes and visit them, that they won't be able to find them if they are participating mm-hmm. in activity. So they might spend a lot of time on their own. And we know that isolation is it's it's really detrimental to anyone's well-being, particularly older persons. So if family can help them attend activities and facilitate them, then they'll go, oh, yes, you know, my daughter knows that this is where I will be because I do enjoy discussion group or I do enjoy exercises or I do enjoy music and so they're more likely to leave the room Mm. rather than you know just sit there and be on their own so I think it's just yeah families play a huge role and often they might not know what is the right way to go about it and what to do so in my booklet I the booklet is personalized I do have hard copies I do have e-copies of that as well so it does allow for the assessment of all the person their interests and how often they've engaged in that pleasant activity in the past month and looking for opportunities where visits can be enhanced and how to go about it step by step. So some wonderful tips in there what about the allied health professionals Uh, You know, as we said right at the beginning, there's a a lack of people who have gone into this field. And, you know, even just from our conversation thus far today, it's really opened my mind up to just how important this is and how perhaps even in some ways behind we are in terms of thinking and talking about the mental health and wellbeing of of older adults. I know now there's a, a lot of conversation about young people and young people's mental health and suicide rate, which is vital, but yet we don't hear these same conversations about people in their older years. So why is there this lack of mental health professionals who work in the field, do you think? There's this number of reasons for that. Um, First off, especially in psychology, not, you know, gerontology is not covered as part of the compulsory content in undergraduate studies, even postgraduate. I've supervised a number of clinical psychologists who were completing their studies and this was, you know, their last placement and a number of them, you know, had uncertainties as to what kind of clinical presentations they would see in aged care homes and the clinical component did not necessarily reflect the theoretical component at university as to how to work with this population. The big issue is that these clients are not ambulant. You're not going to see them as often in a clinical setting. They're not going to arrange transport to come and see you in your consulting room. And I think that there's a lot of fear and reservation in mental health professionals to work with this population because they're they're worried about their safety and they're worried about issues that they might encounter seeing clients outside of that clinical setting. So part of what I teach others is really in how we tackle that and how we look at ways of how we can support people who really are quite vulnerable and, and have a number of barriers to be able to, you know, get out and come and see us in our consulting rooms. I think that a lot of mental health professionals are amazing at what they do in their jobs, but it's just, you know, getting that concept around, no, you actually need to go out there and see the client as opposed to expect them to come to your rooms Mm. um, will take a bit of time to adjust to. So what's happening is that there's just so few mental health professionals who who specialise in that because of those reasons and I know for a fact when I go to a nursing home or even if I do a talk in a retirement village you know can we have your business card can we see you can we you know and so I think it's so important to train more others to be able to do that because you will have that security of 
yes, you will have a flow of referrals. Yes, you will, you know, and you might not need to pay for your rooms for the day because you will be able to go and see people in, in an aged care facility and we talk about those issues that they're concerned about, their safety and, and the likes. Because mm. a lot of those people, even if they live in their own homes, they're used to receiving services. So it really is about, you know, making sure that the, that the mental health professional feels confident about doing something perhaps a bit outside of square. Mm. Yeah, and I can imagine that there would be, I think that lack of exposure perhaps through training, the fact that the conversations aren't had, that gerontology is not addressed as part of the uh, core competencies or the, the core mm. syllabus or curriculum, that's the word I'm looking for. And then perhaps, you know, there isn't the placements that you might have in other fields. But, I, you know, listening to you, I'm thinking, you know, actually... I can imagine there would be a lot of psychs or perhaps trainee psychs now who quite like the idea of getting out and going off elsewhere rather than just sitting in a room and having people come to them every day, you know, to get involved yes. not just with this population but then with a quite a, an eclectic and wide range of other therapies and therapists like the art therapy, like the music mm. therapy, you know, like both the, the medical professionals, the nursing professionals, the care, you know, that I'm sure would very much appeal to some up-and-coming mental health clinicians if they know that that's something that, A, you can do and, B, there's a real need for. Absolutely. So I, I offer a four-week program for mental health professionals on, you know, how to tap into aged care because they do have the skills in delivering clinical services and treatment of depression is very similar across the lifespan because all the people also respond to cognitive behavioural therapies. And so you don't necessarily need to change the core component of how you deliver services. It's more so about looking at those peripheral issues, which I really help them establish how to how to work within that aged care setting and how to engage with aged care staff and how to engage with clients and how to address a number of those concerns. And I also do um, peer supervision with psychologists who work in aged care, there's been a lot of difficulty for aged care psychologists to connect with one another. So I do monthly peer supervision with them and we do it online because issue for a lot of them is, you know, travelling and getting to a place and often they can spend more time commuting and getting to supervision as opposed to actually receiving supervision itself. Mm. So I do small group meetings and we need once a month in an evening online and we have opportunity to discuss different cases and, and strategies and resources that we can share and that's been very successful and I've been doing that for quite a few years now and it fills my heart to see more and more people get into aged care um, with appropriate training and support because we do need to improve those mental health outcomes for all the people regardless of where they live. Yeah, look, Julie, you've absolutely opened my mind to a whole field that I hadn't really, you know, I started thinking it was actually just on the back of a conversation that I had recently with someone about end of life and the fact that it isn't a topic that we talk about much. And I suddenly, you know, the little light bulb went off and I went, oh, that's a podcast topic. Yeah. <laughs> Who can I find? And I, I'm so glad that I found you and that we've been able to have this conversation to give people some thoughts about, you know, the mental health and well-being of this as a, as a population, but also, you know, what our roles, whether we are clinicians, whether we are family members, whether we're just general members of the public who have an interest in helping everybody to thrive and flourish, and what can we do to help? And I think you've really sparked some ideas for me and hopefully for our audience too about how to start to work in a field, you know, really help this population to thrive and flourish as I said you know I think that's that's a wonderful goal and I think you've laid some fantastic groundwork there across three different important populations. Yes thank you Ellen I really am so passionate about this and I think that having seen a number of improvements in clients and clinical outcomes and not only in clients improvements in the confidence of the workforce it really has been so encouraging to keep doing what I'm doing and to really highlight the issue of the importance of wellness in late life. I've had a number of older adults who've moved, you know, into aged care homes and initially they found it difficult, but with the right support, they're actually better and they are 
thriving. And despite the health setbacks that they may have had, they're going on bus trips, they're enjoying, they really are making the most of that time in aged care home or even in their own home if they haven't moved into aged care. But they're doing well and it's just about receiving the right support and knowing how to go about it that they can achieve those outcomes. And I think that's a wonderfully positive perspective to take on the situation because we hear so much about the dismal and the doom and gloom, but to be able to take that positive approach and really look at how do we help and then to have been able to see that yourself, you know, it must be enormously gratifying to see those outcomes. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, supporting the families as well because they're going through this difficulty and and giving them the right resources to say, hey, this is what you can actually do as opposed to, oh, it's too late, you know, give up and this is it. There's a lot of ways that they can actually improve their relationship with their loved one using the right support and strategies. Wonderful. Julie, if we have inspired, and I'm sure we have, our listeners to find out a little bit more and and to think more deeply on this particular topic, where can they find you? They can find me on wisecare.com.au. So that's the name of your consulting business, Wisecare. Yep, so wisecare.com. Dot au. We will put a link to that in the show notes for this episode, as well as a link to uh, some of the tips that you've provided, particularly for families who are wanting to support their loved ones. And are there any other tips or resources that you'd like to share or recommend? Yes, um, I have quite a few resources on my website that they can download for free. It includes information on how to engage conversation or how to start conversation with a loved one who might have cognitive changes, how to start conversations with older people in general. So there's quite a few resources that if you visit my website, you can download for free. And you have a podcast yourself, do you not? I do have a podcast myself, The Voice of Aged Care, where I interview quite a wide range of people who work with the elderly and we really look at those um, non-pharmacological strategies that they use to boost well-being in older people. Wonderful. So that's a must listen, The Voice of Aged Care. Yes. So uh, for anybody who wants to learn a little more or delve a little more deeply into what sounds like a fascinating and enormously satisfying field. Julie, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alan. I'm very glad that you've invited me to um, be a guest on your show. And I wish you all the very best of luck, although I'm confident that you don't need it in pursuing your great mission and three-pronged attack to help really change the landscape in the well-being of the aged care sector. Thank you. As I said during that interview, I really hope that Julie has inspired you to think about the older adults in your life and to consider how you might be able to support them to thrive and flourish. I really applaud Julie for the work she's doing, for getting so actively involved in her field and setting herself big goals to really make a difference. It's wonderful stuff and I'm so glad that we've been able to bring this episode and this conversation out into the world to align with Are You OK Day and to generate some conversation about the well-being in older adults. We'll all be there one day with a bit of luck. If you'd like to find out more about Julie, her business Wise Care, her podcast, The Voice of Aged Care, and to tap into those resources that she mentioned, we've put the links to everything in the show notes for this episode. So pop over to potential.com.au forward slash podcast. We are coming to the close of this season of the podcast with only two episodes left. So if you'd like to know when we're back and what's coming up for next season, please join the Potential Psychology email community. I send semi-regular emails to the community to keep you up to date with episodes, news and events, articles and resources that I've discovered that I think you might like and find helpful. And you can get all of that in your inbox if you join in at potential.com.au you forward slash subscribe and finally thank you so much if you're one of the wonderful listeners who's recently left a review and rating of the potential psychology podcast on apple podcasts i realize that this is not nearly as easy to do as we'd like it to be so i really do appreciate the time and effort and commitment that you've shown to get that review written and out there into podcast review land And if you are keen to review the podcast, and I do read and appreciate every review, I've included a link to a great how-to write-up for podcast reviews, and it's in the sidebar of the podcast page on my website. So that's over at potential.com.au forward slash podcast. 
What's coming up next week? Well, I am talking to Jared White, who is a Melbourne-based clinical psychologist, and we're going to throw around a few ideas about the future of mental health and mental health support. Jared is the co-founder of The Lives of Others, which provides an online platform for people to share their mental health and mental ill health stories. He's really interested in how we can provide mental health services in different formats to traditional one-on-one therapy. So how can we reach bigger groups? and different audiences and what are we missing by being in a therapy room and it's a topic that aligns beautifully with our purpose here at the podcast and I'm really excited to be bringing that conversation to you but until then go forth and thrive and flourish and fulfill your potential and I will speak to you soon